Sketch make this? Hey everybody, Xsketch back with more Tear in the X Files, and we're in the second half of season four. So get those tissues ready because oh, we are starting out with Leonard Betts. And if ever you wanted to know a more contentious, I, I mentioned in the first half about the the switcheroos that were happening happening with a good number of the episodes uh, out of production order. If you ever wanted to know a more contentious switch in the uh, episode order, oh, Leonard Betts and Never Again. To this day, I know uh, f there are fans who will watch uh, Never Again before Leonard Betts. And I kind of get it. I, I, <laughs> I don't actually fall on either side of the fence or on which way to watch them. Uh, for those who don't uh, don't know, basically Leonard Betts was moved up uh, a week so that it would air after the Super Bowl, which of course would get more viewing figures because Never Again deals with Scully being an independent woman going off on her own and not willingly following Mulder, Mulder's orders and having needs and wants and desires and how dare she as a woman in the 90s. That would never get viewing figures, but Scully getting uh, cancer, that definitely. I mean, to be fair to this episode, this episode is amazing. And I get why you would ever put, you would, you would absolutely put this out as an episode to entice new viewers. But yeah, it's, it's problematic, especially again, as a binge watching experience. Uh, because so Leonard Betts deals with uh, the titular character played by Paul McCrane brilliantly. I hadn't seen ER at the time. I was a Chicago Hope person. Uh, I didn't watch ER until much later, uh, at which point it was then weird seeing him uh, in uh, seeing him as a uh, Dr. Romano and being an asshole. When Leonard Betts is this again falls in what this show does really well kim manner said in the, the behind the scenes thing is that the thing he learned from the x-files was that your your villains even the most heinous villains had to have some heart or groundwork sometimes and it's something that comes up later on in uh Ghoulie in season 11. now i've got season 11 in my head and um, but no, Ghoulie was a good episode. Uh, but, you know, Mulder says uh, monsters have to have heart and stuff like that. And Lana Betts is just doomed because he needs to survive on cancer. Uh, he lives on tumours and stuff like that. It's the only way he can, uh, you know, survive. Much like, you know, tombs or whatever. But he doesn't want to do it. He, he doesn't revel in the idea of doing it. He just... He just has to do it. Uh, and, you know, the fact that then you have a scene later on where it turns out his mum, uh, his mother has a tumour and he has to uh, take it out of her and stuff like that. Uh, I just, I love the groundwork for this character. Uh, this is, uh, I think, our first uh, Gilnitz uh, collaboration. Uh, Vince Gilligan, John Scheiben and Frank Spotnitz. Uh uh, directed by Kim Manners, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure, it's, yeah, Kim Manners, um, and it's just the character work here, the depth to this character is just amazing and enthralling to watch, you are so engaged, because you're like, oh god, he's, he's doing this, he's killing people and that, but you're intrigued in his story, you want to follow him, you know, it's really weird when you're seeing that actually, you know, he gets decapitated in the teaser. But all he has to do is lay in a bath of uh, iodine, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and he could grow his head back. Which doesn't make sense later when he then sheds his skin in this, yes, admittedly gross. But the green screening, it, it's great for the 90s. Again, we're talking like, what, 1996, 1997. Uh, it's excellently done and terrifying, uh, but watching it now, it's a little odd to watch because it's, it's just, yeah, the green screening is a little off. Um, but yeah, he, he doesn't need to rebirth his whole body when he 
uh, gets decapitated. But later on, he does need to rebirth himself to clone himself or something. I was just like, okay. Um, but yeah, of course, the ma the main thing, you, you follow uh, Leonard this whole episode as he's, you know, he, he just, he, he runs on these uh, ambulance runs and that and tries to save people, by which he mean, I mean he looks for <laughs> victims and diagnoses them. Um, and you've got Mulder and Scully trying to figure out what happened to his body when it, it, it kicked its way out of the morgue. And I just, I love the action in this episode. Uh, and just that, that hook at the end, uh, that, that Betts is pursuing Scully because she has what he needs. And just that look on Scully's face and the camera holds. And I remember the first time I saw this, I was like, wait, well, what? What does he mean? And then it clicked. It took me way too long to figure it out. But I was just like, wait, what? And it absolutely makes sense. It, it should have made sense way sooner than episode 13. Uh, because obviously uh, we had the whole stuff with the other, you know, um, Betsy Hagopian and that in uh, Piper Meru uh, Apocrypha and that. Um, no, wait, is it Piper Mario Apocrypha? Again, I always get Piper Mario Apocrypha and this size 731. Uh, God, anyway, that. <laughs> Those, that, in season three, it came up. So, I'm sorry, I sh I'm going to put it up on you. That's bothering me now. I should have checked that before uh, recording this. Um, but yeah, no, it. You had those other other abductees that Scully met in the MUFON group. And they were all like dying from cancer and stuff like that. And I said it at the time that, you know, there was when I was tearing season three, I said, you know, it's funny to hear Sc Scully tell Mulder, you know, you've not asked me where I've been and stuff like that. And he's like, but you're OK, Scully. And she's like, oh, yeah, I, I think. Am I? <laughs> and you're like. Oh, and in hindsight, it's it's absolutely upsetting. Uh, so yeah, it, I'm I'm so glad they came back to that. They laid the groundwork there in season three. It was nice to finally see some kind of payoff for that. Unfortunately, it does mean at at the you know at Scully's health. Um, but yeah, dramatic, just an all round amazing episode. A great monster of the week. Uh, that is then a part of a serialised story, you know, leading in for the rest of the season. Uh, I think it shows what... I think it just goes to prove what the show could do if it let itself serialise itself, have more connected... And I don't think anything proves this more, actually, than Elegy later on. Um, but, yeah, no, to lay that groundwork, to have that cliffhanger where you're just like, wait, what? excellent episode uh unfortunately so not unfortunately but this is the thing actually i'm going to talk about it when we talk about never again uh because we have such good good dramatic um you know uh scenes with Mulder and scully not to do with the cancer but that's more a memento mori thing but I think this is an excellent two-parter if you watch it with Memento Mori. Uh, both were written by the the, the trio of Gilnets. Um, uh, Memento Mori had uh, Chris Carter involved as well. But yeah, I think it works better as a two-parter. And it is it is sad to, to break it up with Never Again. But at the same time... It keeps you waiting in a way uh, because you're kind of, oh, what what happened? Where was it? Because you have this scene at the end where Scully wakes up with her nose bleeding. Conveniently, her nose has never bled before this, but she finds she gets told she's got cancer and all of a sudden she's like got blood on her, waking up to, to blood, uh, blood, nosebleed. Sorry, I do know words. Um, 
And that's an amazing, uh, you know, cliffhanger to then not address it remotely. I would like to say that Never Again is her rebelling while maybe waiting for test results on that. Maybe some kind of uh, life, uh, you know, threat to her life has... Uh, but anyway, yeah, it is odd to break this up uh, because the two episodes, Lena Betts and Momentum Mori, go so well together. Um, but without question, um, without even hesitation, uh, that was a little uh, tangent that I should have waited until talking about Never Again about. But um, without question, Lena Betts, beautiful episode. Just an excellent Monster of the Week episode. Like I said, you really care for the uh, for, for Betts' character in that, uh, even though he's doing these heinous things. Uh, S Frank, without question. Um, and not just because Vince Gilligan is involved in the writing. Um, but yeah, then... Then we come to Never Again. Now, Gillian has said if she knew that Never Again would come after Leonard Betts, she would play Scully so differently. Uh, and I, but I don't know how she could... I, just, I know the scripting could have been very different. Uh, and again, I think if, if the script had, had allowed, and especially it's just... It's very difficult to think of me, uh, for me to think of Mulder and Scully at odds at the end of this episode, just sat there at the desk in silence, unsure what to say, unsure of how to go forward in a way. Um, and then to have Memento Mori, where they are so close. And, you know, Mulder's the first person she calls and, and all that stuff. Their dynamic is so different. It, the dynamic in Memento Mori is more like it is in Leonard Betts. Um, but Never Again is written by uh, Glenn Morgan and James Wong, um, directed by Rob Bowman, and apparently uh, it happened... I think there were other ideas for things they wanted to do. Uh, this is Morgan and Wong's last episode of the season. Uh, it is their best one, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, out of the season. Um, I mean, other than Home, obviously. Like I say, Home was a really good episode. Uh, <laughs> Never Again is one of those ones that I always go, no, nah, I'm not watching it. But I actually like it. I actually enjoy it more than I should. Uh, it has Morgan and Wong's trope of, uh, you know, the whole uh, using an old song. It's the Partridge Family's uh, Doesn't Somebody Want to Be Wanted by Me. Um, and uh, it... it we follow Rodney Rowland's Ed Jess, who gets a tattoo, he's just divorcing, and there's some hallucinogen in the ink. Uh, and <laughs> he then starts hearing a voice. That's Jodie Foster. They actually got Jodie Foster, who, of course, Clarice Starling in uh, Silence of the Lambs was the inspiration for Scully. Uh, so I think it's excellent and it's something very full circle which seems, you know, hilarious considering Scully gets a, a, Rob a robberous uh, tattoo. Uh, it's funny that the show in a way comes full circle to have, uh, you know, to have Jodie Foster. Of course they then would have, then would have Darren McGavin in, in season five as Arthur Dales. Uh and of course, Night Stalker was the inspiration for the show and everything like that. So I love that they get all those things tie in to the series to get actors that are uh, that have contributed into the foundation in some way of the show. Um, and I just enjoy I enjoy it's a little it's a little over the top. But at the same time, I really enjoy the. Uh, Jodie Foster as Betty, the tattoo. Um, apparently, Gillian went to Morgan and Wong and asked for more depth, more desires for poor Scully. Um, it's something I didn't talk about in season one. The pilot original, because, you know, somehow I managed to tear a, a whole season in literally 90 minutes. I still don't know how I did that. Bravo me. Um, but... In the pilot episode, originally, Scully was supposed to have a boyfriend, uh, Ethan. 
and they he got cut i think it was for time and and basically i think fox put a lot of pressure on chris carter to get rid of the boyfriend uh because they wanted the path cleared so that then you had this will they won't they between Mulder and scully and i get that but i actually think it would have been better i know it maybe would have made the show a bit more uh soap opera ish but i think it would have been better to this this does have something to do with never again i'm not just completely randomly waffling on i mean i am but anyway um <laughs> um but i think it would have made more sense uh to maybe show the strain that the job had on her relationship and then even just disappeared maybe after a few weeks or something um but the whole point was that you know the idea was to show how all-consuming this job was that you know the x-files was just all-consuming um but scully like i get it's annoying that they show Mulder having sex with like the vampires in free and you can say oh it's because he was in emo mode or something but it's like it's okay for him to have sexual desires and all that stuff but scully has to stay pure and true and virtuous and you're just like look this isn't her life it has become her life as scully says at the end you know this isn't my life you know this and and it's so frustrating that apparently Gillian gets a lot of people saying, oh, you're so unscullyish. And she's like, how? How? It's like, she's just frustrated. Uh, you know, Mulder and Scully have working, been working tirelessly and she's fed up with being ordered about. It does annoy me, though, that they had to cut. There's a bit where they don't even let you see Scully kiss Edgers. It's like he, he's holding her hand, holding her wrist to stop her touching the tattoo or whatever. And then he leans in and you're like, oh, they're going to kiss. But then it cuts away because heavens forbid we should see the woman kiss another man. It's, it's frustrating. I get it. 90s. Let's just keep using that excuse, shall we? Because that will just forgive everything. 90s, 90s attitudes, whatever. Um... But I think it's absolutely fair to have Scully get frustrated and that. Like I say, I don't necessarily think it works at this point in the series. It either should have come sooner. Certainly maybe after what happened in Heron Volk and stuff. Uh, I, I, I definitely think it should have come sooner. Uh, it's just difficult to watch episodes like, you know, Tungus Gautama and just that absolute worry and, and care between the two of them. And then she's just like, I can't even deal with you now, Mulder. And he's acting bitchy as well. And again, I think just... Maybe you could say it's the sexual tension. Uh, yeah, it's just... It is interesting to see Scully's talk with Jess. Um, you know, where she's saying, you know, she's always had this thing for father figures... Uh, she's always looked up to you know the mentors and men in her life um you know and then there's other fathers uh and apparently in the script it's like she's trying to find a way to describe Mulder's place in her life uh i think it's a really interesting sort of story um depth wise i think it's a fun story as well just regarding a tattoo again you're you're using a monster of the week to drive uh the relationship of Mulder and scully and and show the frustrations and needs of their characters uh in the grand scheme of things uh too much of the time this show like tries to you know divert away from anything too deep too close to the bone it's all implication so that then you're you're not affected if you're not interested in that side of the relationship uh so you'll have looks and touches and worried you know molders or scullies or whatever um without as usual it's you know any kind of commitment um but i think it's absolutely uh vital really to show that scully is a woman with wants and needs and give that depth to her character uh i enjoy jodie foster i enjoy rodney Rowland. i think it's interesting that you could say 
you know, uh, Jess has a passing resemblance to Mulder and it's funny that she then is attracted to him. Um, I think it's sad that Scully's tattoo was never brought up again in that we don't know if she still has it. It never gets seen again, uh, even in like an accident or something. Um, Mulder makes some passing reference to, you know, how she wasn't affected by this hallucinogen as bad. Um, but yeah, it is funny to think of Scully going around with a tramp stamp. It turns up in so many fan fictions, especially for smart fix, obviously. Um, I actually like this episode way more than I normally give it credit for. I just, I think its placement is really problematic. Like, really problematic. I actually think it would have worked better after Memento Mori. I think maybe Memento Mori should have been uh, shuffled up. Uh, maybe pushed never again further back. Uh, I just think its placement is all wrong. It, it's just, like I say, Gillian said she would play it differently. Uh, and and just, it doesn't work, but sandwiched. I don't think it works. But I get why people still watch it in the right order. Uh, especially because it does feel like Scully rebelling. And maybe if she's, you know, she thinks that she's at threat, it makes sense she would go off and, and maybe, you know, have this uh, uh, adventure. Uh, I do think it's interesting to think of that this was, like I say, Morgan and Wong's final episode and they were just done. They were frustrated and, uh, you know, they had other ideas, but apparently Glenn Morgan was like, yeah, no, we don't. <laughs> we, you know, we were being taken advantage of and stuff like, you know, we didn't feel like our stuff was being paid attention to. Uh, and yeah, you can feel that frustration in this episode. I think lines like Scully's, you know, we just take two, uh, one step forward and two steps back. Um, I, I really feel that Morgan and Wong's frustrations with the show uh, as well coming through there. I actually like this episode way more than I ever give it credit for. Um, and hmm, looks like I normally skip it. I don't know if I would necessarily call it an S rank. I'm actually kind of torn on this because I actually think it's really good character development. Uh, I still feel like kind of Scully gets shafted a bit and uh, I feel bad that, you know, <laughs> after Jack Willis, she's not having the best of luck with boyfriends. Um, hmm. Where should I put it? Oh, this is a toughie. I'm going to put it in A. I'm going to put it in A. I, I do feel it... I feel like it struggles with its story at times in that it does feel like it's just trying to be vindictive at times. Uh, and just try to be, oi, arseholes, be kinder to Scully, you know, see Scully for who she is, not just Mulder's uh, lackey, uh, side, a side uh, kick. Um, yeah, I'm going to put in a... I, 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 I don't think I would put it... I, I, <laughs> I would put it between the two, to be honest. But um, no, I'm going to go for A because it's it's not one I go to regularly. But I do enjoy it. Uh, but I mean, let's let's <laughs> the big one, the big one, Memento Mori, Unus Anus. Sorry, I had to. <laughs> let's not even dilly dally again. Let's S rank without question. Uh, again, as I said before, this is a, a John Scheiben, Vince Gilligan, Frank Spotnitz and Chris Carter uh, story. Um, continuing on from Leonard Betts, pretending like never again. <laughs> uh, directed beautifully by Rob Bowman. Uh, and this, this is just, I, I'm pretty, I would not be shocked if you told me that, you know, the, 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 the Gilnitz trilogy uh, the, the Gilnish trio wrote the episode and then Chris Carter just wrote the monologues. I would not be shocked if you told me that. Because this is monologue 101. Um, but it is genuinely beautiful. Starting out with that absolutely stunning shot of uh, uh, the pans in of Scully looking at this x-ray of the tumour uh, 
uh, in her, uh, uh, you know, in her sinuses, uh, in her nasal, um, just with this beautiful, poetic, over, oh, um, you know, overdub, uh, um, voiceover with Scully addressing Mulder and apologising for not continuing the rest of the journey with him. And you're just like, this is too much already. We're not even five minutes into this episode and you're already reaching for those tissues. Uh, we have the, the opening scene where Scully tells Mulder that she's got cancer. And he's like, and it turns out, like I say, he is the first, she says, you're the first one I've called. She doesn't call her mother. She doesn't call any, no, Mulder is the first one she calls. And you're just like, and again, this episode, and I said it with other Vince, I said it with the other Vince Gilligan episodes. This episode is so good at, again, it's a myth arc episode, but it's an exploration of, everybody's relationship essentially with scully from here on out we have the gunman helping here helping Mulder break into this uh uh to this building which is then when they find out that scully's oncologist is on staff there and i will say though that is my only issue that is an open thread that never gets touched on again we don't know what happened to this dr scanlon we don't know uh what he was actually doing i'm not clear on what the point of him was like was he working with csm's group were they like just monitoring her were they trying to make sure she died sooner or something i'm a little that that was a bit thrown up in the air and, and just left to just like because once Mulder finds the kirk crawfords but then he's been like chased by this assassin and you're just like wait who are all these people working for or working with like the Kirk Crawford said they're trying to protect their mothers they didn't do a very good a job of that considering Betsy Hagopian and Penny Northern is is there at the hospital uh you know all these move on they're saying oh there are mothers and again these are the adult versions of the kids that we saw in uh, heron volk the season opener um and you're like okay so have they got red hair because scully like but and then like i don't understand how the whole cloning process works the hybrid stuff uh regarding like mothers i get that they're born to them and stuff while they're in the you know abducted kind of thing but yeah, it's a bit, it does not help that again, the Kirk Crawfords are people, much like the Gregors or, or whatever, they're introduced and then just get killed off. They get wiped away so quickly. It is insane. That is my biggest issue. And again, that's more a show trope than anything else. Um, but yeah, that whole just, oh, uh, they were here and then they just got wrecked. And it's not even by the alien bounty hunter. It's just some guy uh, who turns up and I think we're left to assume that they all got killed. Um, but this is such a beautiful... This is... Let's be honest. This is... I love that Mulder's the first one Scully phones. And then we have so much when she goes on her journey, you know, finding Penny Northern, the last victim of that move on group uh and and she's there for her and and she sees what's on the horizon and it's just the so and the phone calls be between Mulder and scully scully's diary scully's diary will tear your heart out it's just beautiful i you know i have so many issues with chris carter's monologues at times but here it was so befitting and, and, you know, it worked because it makes sense while Scully's going through this journey, through this experience to write down her thoughts uh, so that Mulder, should she pass away before he manages to find something, um, that he's got something to hold on to. And you're just like, this, this kills me. This absolutely amazing episode. Uh, that's why it had to go immediately in S rank. Uh, love it. Love it to bits. It's just, there's so much here to like about it. 
I love when they catch Kurt Crawford at first and, you know, Mulder's notices her nose bleeding and he's like, you know, just he doesn't say anything. He's just staring and you can see the absolute terror in his face. But he's just like he just wipes his nose to indicate to her without making a big scene. But then she's like, Mulder, stop staring. Stop staring. And he's like, and he's like, mm, and you just want to hug them both. You want to hug them both so much. And then when they're questioning Kurt Crawford and, and she's like, oh, you know, they're all dead, this, that, and the other. And Mulder's like, question as a doctor, as a federal agent. Don't think of this as personal. Uh, Mulder puts himself on the line, you know, wanting to, to question Smoking Man. But then Skinner, Skinner takes that. Like I say, this is an amazing, this is how it affects everybody. So, let's see if, you see, poor, poor Mrs. Scully. She turns up, she's absolutely pissed as hell she's just like why didn't you tell me immediately and you're just like yeah dana why didn't you fine tell Mulder. and fine say you're trying to find answers but at least tell your mum at some point this poor woman is constantly worrying as it is thankfully managed to get stuff done without crying the whole time like mrs Mulder. but yeah poor <laughs> poor ma Mulder, uh, ma, ma scully but kudos to Sheila Larkin for pulling that, just that frustration and emotion off. You see the sacrifice that Skinner makes, and, and we see it later in Zero Sum. You see Mulder's effect. You see the lone gunman helping out. Uh, it's just this whole group of people that are just affected by the illness and prospective death of this one character. Um, it's amazing. The ripples it just shows. And... Yeah, I think it's brilliant and it's just uh, what it sets up for the rest of the season. Like I say, it's amazing. It just surprises me that it this episode is not until this point, you know, in, in the in the series, uh, you know, episode uh, 14, 15, you know, kind of things. So, um, but brilliant. Oh, I just, it's heartbreaking every time. It doesn't matter how many, and the action in it is excellent so yeah i i highly recommend it i will add though that i'm glad that they didn't keep the kiss scene which i know is insane to hear from me of all people um but for those who don't know basically in the the last scene that Mulder and scully have together in this uh, the, the beautiful hug scene uh david duchovny and Gillian anson wanted to give it a try where after Mulder kisses scully on the forehead he then kisses her on the lips uh, now, I'm glad we have this, this footage exists and we are able to see it, but I really don't think it would have worked. Like, I mean, we get plenty of kisses and all that and, and stuff in the Redux uh, duo. Uh, but when, when she's at the hospital and it's just like, but it, it, I think it would take away from any later progress in a relationship. Uh, it would just feel like a throwaway thing, you know, just friends. Uh, yeah, it just feels like a throwaway thing that we've not really had much lead up to. I think what actually would have been more powerful is if Mulder had kissed her on the forehead and then they had, like, rested the foreheads against each other. Because if there's one thing we know about these two, their forehead sex game is on point. <laughs> so I think actually that might have been even more touching again we're only in season four uh but yeah i think it would have taken away from the impact of a more uh, a much bigger kiss kind of more romantic more intimate uh situation so uh yeah i i i'm glad they cut that scene um and i think actually it plays into because uh, the writers wanted Mulder, apparently, according to the documentary, they wanted Mulder to be more heroic in this episode. Because, of course, they did. Um, <laughs> um, but at the same time, Duchovny was, like, insisted that actually he should go through the whole gamut of, like, emotions and stuff and mess up and, and be reckless and try and get in contact with Smoking Man. Uh, and again, that puts then some of that on Skinner's shoulders. Uh, so it's nice that, you know, Mulder knows, uh, Duchovny knows the character enough to know what feels right and when the time for heroic gestures is, is right and not. 
Uh, so I'm glad that he he insisted on that. And I'm like I said, I'm glad they tried the kiss. Um, but at the same time, I'm 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 glad it's not here. Uh, uh, but and and the other the other issue I have with this, and I think I, I won't go too much into detail here, uh, because I think it's more a point to bring up saying per manum in season eight. But sorry, so Mulder gets that vial of Scully's over, um, and keeps it in his jacket pocket for the whole time that he goes to the hospital, and then he's just like, oh. I wonder if this is still viable at the end. And apparently it is. Ta -da! <laughs> I'm like, wait, like surely there would be damage to that after that length, length of time in his pocket. That is just something that's always bothered me. Uh, I'm glad they came back to it and it got mentioned again. But yeah, I was just like, how is that even? I love the way he's handling it though as well with the, the sleeve of his uh, jacket and that. Um, but yeah, that, that just always bothered me. But otherwise, perfect episode. Uh, but going from several really good episodes. Um, yeah, mm, <laughs> to Unrequited. Quite possibly one of the most throwaway episodes you can possibly have. I get what it's trying to do. And I think there are ideas here that are really interesting not a good episode though it does not help that the episode starts this is the worst case of it the episode starts in media's res and just as they're trying to protect this general or whatever up at this vietnam vets rally or something and Mulder, scully and skinner are there and they're trying to stop this guy uh, attacking the general. But then it goes however many hours earlier. And you watch. And then you have to see this whole scene. The whole teaser that goes on for like five minutes. You get to see that whole scene with no differences, no different shots later on in the episode for another five minutes. Yay! It's, mm. So, yeah, it's basically... Uh, it's this guy that was a, a, a POW uh, who just recently got out of Vietnam uh, and he's trying to stop, he, he basically wants to stop the government, uh, the, the military people that are hiding the fact that these POWs are still out there in Vietnam, not completely forgotten about. And, but... His way of doing this, of way of getting to these people, is using their blind spots. Now, I actually think this is a really cool idea to use, uh, you know, blind spots in peripheral vision and stuff, and uh, using a sensory uh, trick to. But I don't think it's particularly well done. And to be honest, I don't really care much for this Nathaniel Tigre guy. I don't care for him anywhere near as much as I did uh, Tony Todd's character in Sleepless. I really don't. He's just there and just glaring all the time. And yeah, you feel bad. And we said before, you know, how vets are treated and, and stuff like that. Uh, veterans, sorry. Um... It's 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 awful, and I think this is a great time again to 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 tap into Skinner's involvement, you know, in Vietnam and stuff, and, and see him dealing with the uh, the the soldiers that were there um, while trying to protect, uh, do his job as an assistant director of the FBI and protect uh, this uh, uh, U.S. Army general. Um, and you have this whole scene where. It turns out Tiga has had has been uh, communicating with this group that's run by Larry Musser, who is very different here from his other roles. Larry Musser is one of those mainstays. I mean, as Canadian shows go, like he turns up in a lot of stuff. But his roles in the X Files, for the most part, have been comedic. We have him in. Uh, uh, Jose Chung's from Outer Space. He was in, um, not so much comedic, uh, in uh, Dihan de Valets. 
Uh, he's in Chinga. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the four. Oh, I can't think. Has he been in another one? My brain is going to... I keep... I keep miss... I'm like, is that him or not? Because he's so different from his other roles uh, in this episode. Uh, it's always fun to see him turn up in stuff. But, yeah, he doesn't get much to work with here. And then he's being interrogated by this this general that's, like, trying to find out what's going on. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of shots. Like I say, time is wasted on this one scene at the rally uh twice you have a lot of scenes of tiga taking out these uh admirals and and stuff like that otherwise there's not much substance to this script and it's just like oh okay and i think this is a howard gordon story i could be wrong um it's just really it feels like you know i know sanguinarium was a spot script but this feels like a spot script it's just like, oh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, really underwhelming. Really just bare bones. There's not much interesting here. I mean, it's, if you turn your brain off, it's okay. But, and like I say, it is fun to watch uh, Skinner getting involved in a, in a case, kind of, you know, in the process of doing his job. <sighs> But I am going to put it, I don't know where I'm going to put it. First off, I can't see where the arrow is, sorry. Um, I am going to put it, where am I going to put it? I kind of want to say B. I don't know if I dislike it enough to put it in C. See, I still feel bad for putting Heron Volk in B. I kind of feel like I should have put that higher up. And I kind of tempted to move it up, to be honest. Um, Heron Vogue is way better than... Oh, I did not mean to do that. Um, where am I going to put it? Um, I'm going to put it in C. I mean, I could... No, I'm going to put it in C. Yeah, it's, it's just so mediocre. I feel bad because there's so much there is a a seed of interesting possibilities here that i just feels like a load of like yeah i don't feel sympathetic to the character or anything um so yeah that's why i got to put that there uh but next up we have got tempest fugit or tempest fudget as i like to call it as a joke time flies uh part one of tempest fugit and max which is an important it's amazing how this is not a myth arc duo uh and yet it has so much there is so much going on here again this is the episode where pendrel gets shot at the end which is just the worst thing to have happened as i said pendrel has become such a uh, uh a great side character in this season you know starting out with stuff like uh the scenes in heronvolk or 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 him finding the seed and identifying it for for molder in teleco uh you know that excellent scene that starts out with uh pendrel being like shouldn't we wait for Agent and scully and, and Mulder's like, uh, she's got a date. And, and Pendrel's like, ooh. And Mulder's just like, relax, Agent Pendrel. It's it's with a with a corpse. And Pendrel just visibly relaxes. Brendan Bicer does not get anywhere near the credit he deserves for his role as Pendrel. For how small it was and yet how impactful that character was. Um, but Tempest Fugit is it's just there is so much here that it owes to season one we have the return of max fennig played by scott bellis who was only in fallen angels so i think it's interesting that they go back to a character that hasn't been mentioned or uh, anything since fallen angel um we have the return of nine minutes being missing being the signifier for alien abduction which again really 
thinking about it, hasn't really been a thing since season one. So it's nice to see a return of that. Uh, yeah, this is just, this is a good callback to season one. Uh, starting out with, so we get, we see Max on this plane and we see it getting affected and like the side of the plane is ripped open and, and stuff like that. And then that, and then the credits roll and you, and you, and, and you're just like, okay, what happened and stuff. Uh, oh no, sorry. It turns out that the plane went down on that, but we don't see a lot of the stuff. We don't find out what happens until later, until the second episode max, which is how you do like in action and then like showing what happened later on not trying to repeat the scene uh it's so different when they repeat the scene later on in max um but yeah we have that tense start and then you have Mulder and scully Mulder like scully's birthday and um molder has got this little cake with a sparkler on it for her and then she gives him this he gives her this keychain from Apollo, uh, an Apollo 11 keychain. The most iconic thing in this show, possibly, other than Scully's cross. Uh, you know, nobody gets there alone. Um, but, yeah, you have that. And then somebody who knew Max pretends to be his sister and gets Mulder and Scully involved because of this plane crash. And just the set piece of this plane crash they got like parts from an actual pl uh, a plane crash including like the tail end of one uh the tail section which they very they they take full advantage of and have this helicopter flying around and getting all these shots of the but we said like in anasazi how good this series does with like these massive uh, set dressings like the painting of the quarry in in in, An in Anasazi and that uh, they have this whole like crash site laid out for a good acre or you know a couple acres or something uh, with just this charred looking earth and apparently it was so realistic that there were news helicopters flying around and they had to go no 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 this is us filming this is a, for a tv show there wasn't actually a plane crash uh, I don't know if that's just an urban legend that news, uh, news uh, helicopters were involved, but that's always the story that I heard. Uh, so, yeah, it's just, it's terrifying. And just seeing Mulder and Scully walking through this crash site and the smoke and the charred bodies and, oh, the set dressing and, and set pieces in this episode and this in this two-parter are just insane and then you have like Mulder and Scully finding out that it was a, a military uh hello uh, of mi military plane that took down and you know took down the interception uh the the and it's just I love the way like the alien stuff and the government stuff and the con the cover-up stuff interlock here and yet it's not a Mifar Cop episode. You don't have Smoking Man and that in it. Yes, you have this creepy guy who's covering stuff up, who looks like a 70s porn star. <laughs> you have this guy going around covering stuff up and that. Um, but it's just the set pieces here are insane. When you have that plane... Um, flying at them while they've been at Mulder Scully and uh and this guy uh the the army guy I don't remember the name of oh my god my brain's gone blank um when they're driving along while being chased and this plane goes to comes towards them and they're trying to get under the plane it is so tense and stressful and you know like nothing can happen to them surely you know there's the rest of the season to get through but just the way it's filmed and the way it's done, executed is just, oh, it's amazing. Uh, this easily, I mean, I, again, Tempest Fugit Max, again, is much like Tunguska uh, Terma, is a two-part that you have to watch together. Uh, this, um, 
this just feels like a big movie though i mean maybe a made for tv movie but um this easily up in s up in s without question and, and we're going to put max up there now um you have to watch this this story is a continuing thing max doesn't feel like a completely different episode altogether it is a continuation of the story it doesn't go mm, let's try something different while we're at it yes you find the alien crash site the 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 molded dives under and finds this ufo and stuff um you've got uh joe sparno guest stars uh as the uh like ntsb guy uh investigating what caused the crash and that uh and uh you know he, he finds uh this woman uh again i can't remember her name um who was uh dealing with uh max uh you have him finding her and, and seeing this spaceship and that and and stuff like that it's just interesting it's always fun to see other people that are like you're absolutely insane to mold the scully then get sucked into their world and see the stuff that they see and have to try and validate and stuff it's always fun to see people uh you know having to go you're crazy but i saw something uh and i don't really feel like we've his his encounter is a little like uh monica reyes actually in um uh this is not happening uh but yeah it's just this is an excellent two-parter action it, you have to watch it back to back there's no there's no question about that and the fact that in max you get to see like what ha well it's presented as Mulder's theory um but at the same time there's no question like you're seeing what happens and just the way it's done seeing these people in this plane getting shook around and sucked out of the plane when it gets taken down uh that moment where max is floating towards the uh, ufo but then it gets taken down and he's gone um it's just heart pounding and thumping and and just it's so well done but you do have to watch them back to back because it is a continuation it's like a movie and i can't tell you how many times i watched the double vhs uh back when i had it i mean i do still have it I'm... god back when i first got it because it was before uh again it was before it aired on bbc so a lot of the times that was my first introduction to these uh these bigger episodes um but yeah no rip rip pendrel um and just that whole scene as well i love the way that again scully has her nose bleeding and that and skinner's like i have a duty of care over when he turns up he's like i have a duty of care over my uh the agents under me and and he thinks she's putting us and she's like look just i need to do this job and he's like okay but somebody higher up is trying to stop this guy from talking and again there's so much of the conspiracy but they don't feature here it's really interestingly done i think it's a a really good uh, way of telling a story that is part of the bigger picture but if you just come to it as a as a two-parter you don't have to know anything really about the 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 conspiracy other than you know shady shit's going on um next up we have got another throwaway episode unfortunately uh in synchrony brought to us by howard gordon and david greenwall who would later go on to work on angel i think he was um i think he co-created it um i just always remember uh his name and thinking wait didn't he write an episode for the x-files and and this was it and it's weird there's quite a lot of uh callbacks in this season to to season one um i'm pretty sure somebody like binge watched season one at some point was just like oh, we haven't mentioned that for a while let's mention that again uh in this case it's uh, scully's uh einstein paradox thesis uh, paper that she wrote um coming back to haunt her when uh, Mulder quotes it at the end and she's like Mulder I wrote that like a long time ago and he's like yeah but that's when you were a bit more open-minded 
And you're like, okay. <laughs> this is a time travel episode um, where, yeah, some old guy comes back to try and stop them from learning the technology. Uh, the older version of uh, Jason Nichols, uh, this MIT student, uh, who with a friend and his girlfriend are, are working on working on free radicals or whatever it is um and yeah he comes back to stop it and because he's an idiot um he 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 kills like his mate and that and he kills this other asian uh asian uh student um and and he's supposed to kill his girlfriend but he can't bring himself to do it but then he's like no i gotta do it so he does it but before he does it he tells her basically how the technology is developed oh my god which means when she is saved she then knows the information of what to do with how to manipulate the atoms and stuff and you're like oh my god you moron i just anyway this episode it's just it's an interesting concept it was only a matter of time let's be honest before the x-files dealt with uh that it dealt with time travel I, I think it's an interesting concept, but I think it's quite a bland episode. It feels like a, very much like a filler episode. Mulder and Scully don't feel like they do much, um, which is fine. We've seen that they can be, you know, very on the outskirts sometimes. This feels like a very personal story for the Doctor and his girlfriend and the older version of him, you know, uh, the older version of Nichols, uh, wanting to do the right thing and stuff like that but just absolutely screwing up um i just i don't know it's a good idea it's it's not it's a natural story for the x-files uh but i just i don't know i just find it quite meh really meh um it's fun to it's fun to watch fun is not the right word it's it's okay to watch but it is a filler episode uh and it feels very much like it and there's actually really not that much to say uh because you're just following these characters just going i feel like i should care but i don't and so much time is spent on the whole trying to revive the uh the asian doctor uh asian professor so much time is and then he dies and then you have the whole process again while Scully is a boss and manages to, manages to save the girlfriend. Um, so much time is wasted on those scenes. And yes, they're tense and shocking when like the whole body catches light and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, otherwise I just don't feel like there's much here. It's not a bad episode. It's just very mediocre. Uh, and as a result... Um, when I click on the right thing, uh, sorry, my eyes are really play playing up today, uh, but unfortunately, it is the 5th of October. I really get this, need to get this video made uh, for it to go up next week. Um, it's really scary seeing, like, it takes two, and that, like, that's been going up for two months, and I haven't got this video bloody recorded. Um, I am going to put this uh, in um, B, because it's just... Eh. And that's what I'm saying about this season. It has got such good episodes. But then you just have these filler ones or f f things that just don't feel right. And you're like, hmm, okay. <laughs> um, but next up is our only humorous episode of the season, which is hilarious because we're in the second half, which is, deals with the cancer arc. Um, yeah, our only humorous episode of the ep of the season, um, Small Potatoes, brought to us by Vince Gilligan. Uh, and it's so funny because, um, so Vince Gilligan cast uh, Darren Morgan, 
who we've missed since season three. Um, Darren Morgan, he's been cast as Eddie Van Blunt with a silent H as this loser who can't get women. Apparently, I kind of feel a kindred spirit with uh, Eddie Van Blunt, won't lie. Um, <laughs> everybody loves, has fun with him, but he just keeps getting friends on, basically. Uh, they're all like, why would I sleep with him? It's like, dude, he's actually not a bad guy. What the hell? Just because he's a nerdy geek. It's a nerdy loser, you know. Um, and, and, and Chris Carter on the documentary about season four, he's like, oh, this episode proves the elasticity of the X-Files, that it can take the story of somebody being... Uh, you know, being born with a tail and turn it into a story about Mulder and Scully's regard for each other. And you're like, okay. I mean, let's be honest, that's the way it works because it's written by Vince Gilligan. But the biggest episode, biggest issue with this episode, apologies for knocking the mic, um, is that of course, essentially, Van Blunt is raping these women. And Scully at one point says, you know, I can speak on behalf of all the women that essentially this is rape. Um, but, and again, that feels really off. The way she says it is just like, I can speak for all women that nobody's going to sleep with this guy. And you're just like, wait, what? <laughs> um, but it's just, yeah. This is an awkward episode to talk about because I really enjoy it. It is so well written. It is so entertaining. Morgan as Van Blunt is really entertaining. Uh, David Duchovny did some really good observations of like expressions and stuff that Morgan does. And he then incorporated them into Van Blunt as Mulder. Uh, because Van Blunt can shapeshift, but he's not a bounty hunter. He can shapeshift. Uh, and even Mulder says, oh, actually, at one point, he's like, he's like, we've seen this before, Scully. And she's like, so are you saying he's a, an alien? And Mulder's like, no, no. Not unless there's trailer parks in space. <laughs> so it's nice to see Mulder going, yeah, no, we have seen this before, but I don't think he's one of them. Um, Van Blunt, there's this excellent bit where, so... Duchovny does these excellent bits where you can see he's trying to be like Van Blunt as Mulder and just these little ticks and stuff like that. It's really well done. Uh, they also do this really good job of uh, Van Blunt Mulder has a slightly different tie to Mulder except in one shot. It's just this slight error in continuity that I know I don't know if anybody else has noticed it when Mulder is going to go check on uh, Amanda Nelligan uh, the one who turns up first and reports about her baby being born with a tail uh, who then reports that she uh, slept with Luke Skywalker which is the funniest thing when Scully <laughs> the line when Scully says did he bring his lightsaber <laughs> Mulder's just sat there going no what have I done? Come in here. Um, but yeah, it, the writing there is brilliant. Um, but yeah, there's this bit where Mulder turns up to query uh, uh, Amanda a bit further. And it's after uh, Van Blunt's Mulder leaves the room. And um, they both had the same tie on. There was a, some error there that's been made. And they both have the same tie on. But it, it gets sorted out for now. It's the only time I noticed it. But they have a very good way of... Because a lot of people in the scene where Scully is autopsying... Um, not autopsy, but examining uh, Van Blunt's dad. Who's been dead for some time and, and left in like a uh, uh, lie or whatever. Uh, she's examining his body. And how the, the muscles work and stuff like that. And the tail and that. Uh, a lot of people, when Mulder turns up and he accidentally breaks off the tower now, a lot of people think that's Van Blunt's Mulder. But actually he's wearing normal Mulder's tie. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a really good distinction between the two. 
And like I say, I think Duchovny actually really well plays it to play the uh, Van Blunt Mulder. Um, but yeah, it is it is a shippy episode. Uh, to have that scene at the end, it's nice to know that Scully is... Uh, all it takes is a little alcohol for her to be rem remotely like, yes, Mulder, jump my bones. Uh, but yeah, that scene. And then the end bit where Mulder is like... And Scully's like, you're no loser. And he's like, yeah, but I'm no Eddie Van Blunt. And it's just, it's a lot for their relationship. And it shows, again, like, the possibilities. But not at the same time. It's just really well done. But, but. I love this episode. It is so funny. It's so good. Again, a changing tone for the whole season. The whole scene is such a... The whole season is such a downer and horror and stuff like that. Uh, it is nice to have this this levity, uh, especially in in a in a ongoing set of episodes that are very emotionally charged. But it deals with this guy raping people, and much like say, unfortunately, then Chris Carter kind of does his own version for postmodern Prometheus. But he's essentially dealing with a guy who is raping women without their knowledge, pretending to be their husbands and stuff like that. Um, you know, those those men are not genetically, you know, the kids' fathers and stuff like that. Uh, and he's raping them, and it's just used as a joke thing. And and Van Blunt at one point is just like, oh, you make it sound so unromantic and stuff like that. And you're like, oh my God! Dude, you're going round and raping women. This, this, I mean, I mean, why not just make yourself look like a hot guy? You know, like, I don't know, like, in inverted commas. What you think is hot, because clearly they like something about you. Um, again, it's showing shallowness and, and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it's just like, don't pretend to be the person's spouse. That's just, it's just played for laughs and it is frustrating and unfortunate. And it's unfortunate because I have to put this, I have to, I have to put this episode in S because it's that entertaining and I feel so bad and dirty for having, for doing that <laughs> just because of that. It, it, it's so unfortunate and I know times have changed and since I mean rape has never been okay guys I don't know why people were making it out that rape is suddenly now not a, a big no-no um yeah it's just how light-hearted light it takes the subject matter um that is frustrating but it's such a good episode it's so well acted so well written and really entertaining character wise with the the Mulder scully dynamic uh i don't know what else to say about it i just it's unfortunate it's so frustrating there is a lot to be said about like this the themes as a result but yeah no i can't i can't put that any lower it's too good too enjoyable an episode um but next up we have got Zero Sum, which is an odd one. This is a, a Skinner, a Skinner centric episode. Uh, Mulder turns up a couple of episodes, a couple for, for a couple of scenes. Sorry, um, but Gillian is completely absent. This is like one of the few episodes she was never in. Uh, I think there's like all of what three episodes total in the main run of the show that she was never in, and this is one of them. Uh, and I think that's because they were getting in prep for uh, filming Fight the Future. I think they were in pre-production uh, around the time that this was filmed. Um, so yeah, as is has become a tradition since uh, season three, uh, the the the. the it focuses on Skinner and again we are focusing on that choice that Skinner made 
to put himself in danger, to put him back into Smoking Man's pocket after getting himself out in a paperclip. Um, he gets himself back in uh, Smoking Man's, uh, you know, under his, uh, in his pocket to, uh, to try and get a cure for Scully. Uh, and this is a follow-up to that by doing Smoking Man's dirty work because we're back with the bees this i i said it before bees were amazing and i'm so glad they continued to use them in laying that groundwork for carrying this virus uh which then finds that we turn out is uh, like a smallpox uh variation um again kind of continuing the groundwork that's been laid by heron volk and even the tunguska terma uh, double um you know with the the Khan Sayers, uh um papers on the variola virus and stuff like that uh so yeah we we see skinner um working for smoking man uh hot, burning incinerating this body that has been attacked by the bees that were being posted there's something very um effemasculata about this the fact that the 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 thing carrying the deadly weapon is just being shipped through the usps that's just hilarious um but yeah he's having to clear up this test and uh he then faces there's a lot of great scenes between mitch Pileggi and william b davis as skinner is just like you have no, especially later when Mulder catches up and he's like when Mulder catches up with Skinner for the first uh, time in this episode. And uh, again, more naked Skinner in this episode. It's great. We get to see Skinner in his tighty whities <sighs> Honestly, this, this show just needed more Mitch. I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm just sorry. I got distracted then. Um, no, you see Sk Mulder turn up and he's like, and Skinner's like, oh, why isn't Scully helping you? And Mulder's like, she's at the hospital. And you see that concern from Skinner of like, wait, is there something I should know? What's going on? And I was like, no, no, it's it's fine. You know, she her, her oncologist has said as everything's okay. They just keep an eye on it to, to make sure it's not metastasized. And you see Skinner then go to Smoking Man and, and being like, she's in the hospital. You have no intention of helping her, do you? And, and Smoking Man's like, yes, I did. We're keeping an eye on Scarly. And this is what bothers me come season 11 where everybody is still listening to this guy and believing every word he says. <sighs> See, again, I, I told you. You got me thinking about Goulia. This got me thinking about Goulia earlier, which made me think of season 11. And now I'm angry. <laughs> um... Yeah, so it's it's interesting to see what Skinner will put on his li on the line for his allegiance to Mulder and Scully, and you know he he protected Mulder by not letting Mulder go into Smoky Man, and he's trying to protect Scully by finding a cure for her. Uh, this is a fun episode, a lot of amazing set again, where then it turns out the bees turn up at this school. Uh, you know we have this the test is going ahead we see these scenes with the syndicate it's fun to see them turn up and and ask if uh and query smoking man again you can always see their distrust in him as they're just like how is you know how is this being dealt with and, and smoking man's like i have a guy on the inside and then they're like but is the test going ahead and he's just like yeah 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 just shut up you know i'm, I'm doing it whatever uh and then you see these bees attack this skull and this teacher who protects this kid who looks like uh gibson praise a little bit uh you know you see you see that and just horrific as all these cgi bees uh are attacking her uh and then you see all these kids dying at this hospital and because Mulder has called marita Kovarubius to find out some information because uh, he's then trying to find out what the hell he was uh, forced to un uh, to cover up uh and yeah it's interesting to see the cat and mouse of Mulder's trying to, Mulder's behind he's trying to find out what happened because he was a part of this case but then you know it got covered up uh you've got Skinner trying to avoid Mulder 
but trying to do his own investigation to find out what the hell he got himself into. Uh, and then when you have Mulder find out that Skinner is the one who was covering stuff up, just the the absolute, like, trust that he loses at that moment. He's like, why? Why? And, and Skinner's like, I told you to uh, take some, you know, to not follow uh, some paths. I didn't listen to my own advice. It's a reason why, you know, I think you will appreciate. And you could see Mulder just being, like, the respect he gets because he knows that's what he would have done to protect Scully. So, yeah, it's 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 really good just dramatically. Uh, I just, it, this is a really good episode. Again, it's weird because it's a myth arc episode. It's 100% a myth arc episode. You're dealing with the syndicate and these tests they're doing on the American public with the virus, with the bees. And yet it's done, it's kind of like a introduction to the conspiracy, to the myth arc. Uh, if, you, if you're watching the show and you don't know a lot of that stuff and you don't want to sit down for like these big two-parters, uh, I think it's a nice little, you know, um, kind of piecemeal, kind of small introduction. Uh, and it's just fun to watch watch Skinner and and again good action. Um, like I say, he calls in Marita to help him out, and she's like, okay, "Why did you get my number?" And then he's trying to find out. But then we find out at the end that Marita's in contact with Smoking Man, and she's trying to find out what she should tell Mulder regarding the investigation and stuff and what happened. And Smoking Man's like, just like, tell him what he wants to hear. And you're like, okay, what what does Marita have to do with the syndicate? But it's weird because she has a very different role. And I think that's what's interesting about Cova Rubius is her role is so different from... Like, Deep Throat was totally just... I mean, I guess you could say she's kind of a Deep Throat character. But at the same time, you do feel like she's trying to find the answers uh, sometimes. Uh... So, yeah, I think that's, again, that's an interesting little bit thrown in to, to deepen the conspiracy uh, and deepen how how untrustworthy these people are. Um, this is a really good episode. Uh, I would have to put it... Mm, S or A. S or A. I don't really have an issue with it, but it's definitely not one I go back to. Like, if I'm binge-watching it, then I'll watch it without question. But, um, I'm going to put it in... I don't know, guys. I don't know. What should I do? Oh, this is a tough one. I'm so torn. This season, generally, genuinely has me torn up, for the most part, anyway. But... Uh, because, like I say, I'm still questioning where I put Heronvolk. And I'm actually still considering where I put Kaddish. Because I liked it, but it's a little bare bones. So I kind of wonder if I should have put it, moved it down to B. Um, but for this, I am going to put it... I'm going to put it in A. Um... I think some of that might be just because of what, how much the bees just got shot. <laughs> um, some of the stuff where Skinner is investigating can plod a little bit, especially the talk with that woman at the post office. Uh, that that was a little. Eh. Um, but otherwise, really good episode uh, and excellent by, uh, acting by Mitch Pelleggi. Uh but yeah, no, I I love it. Don't get me wrong. I, I kind of want to put it in S, but I just, I don't like it enough. I can't explain it, but I, I don't like it enough to put it in S. So uh, that's why I'm going to put it there. I know I'm going to get a lot of hatred because it does deserve to be higher, but I just can't. I don't, I got to go with my gut. I got to go with my heart and uh, my heart is saying to put it in uh, A. So, uh, 
yeah, sorry guys. Um, next up, we have again. Uh, this is an episode that is a standalone episode and yet is part of the bigger picture. Uh, it's Elegy. A problematic episode that seems to be forgiven its issues because of the feels it brings and the absolutely amazing performances by Gillian Anderson on display here. Uh, yeah, this, this is another episode that harkens back to season one. It's a very Roland episode uh, because it deals with Harold Spuler, an autistic man who has magical powers in that he can see ghosts. Now, the in-episode explanation is that he's dying, so that's how he can see ghosts. But, yeah, it, it just feels like it's another kind of, uh, you know, it doesn't feel the, the most uh, mental health comfortable episode. Uh and, I mean, I know uh, writer John Scheiben was inspired by... Uh, one of his inspirations for this episode was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So he wanted that kind of uh, going to a mental hospital and meeting the patients and, and stuff like that. And it's a good scene, but, yeah, it... I don't know, there's just something... It, there's something about it that very much dates it. Which is fair. It's, again, 1997, you know, 98 kind of thing. But, yeah, it kind of dates it a little bit. And it does not help. So, Harold, who... Uh, he fixates on these girls uh, that visit a bowling alley where... The bowling alley where he works. He keeps their scorecards and has them all memorised and, and everything like that. Uh, he's, he's been working there for, like, 10 years helping out. Uh, uh, Angie's uh, Midnight Bowl or, or whatever the name of the place is. Uh, and Angie Botero, he later gets questioned by Mulder as to whether he thinks Harold could be doing these murders. And Angie goes, oh, he's crazy, but he's sweet. And I'm like, wow, in 10 years you haven't learned to be a bit more respectful of a mental health patient? That sounds a little off. Uh, so, yeah... <laughs> It, the way it's handled here it can be a little off. But the main thing about this episode... So it's, 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 it's a monster of the week. It's not a myth arc episode. But again, we're continuing that string. That, that strand of Scully's cancer with, you know, the nosebleeds that conveniently happen on cue. And she sees the second victim... Uh, in these bathroom stalls when she goes off to, to wipe, clean up her nose and stuff like that. And it's fascinating because it then leads, uh, you know, Scully's really shaken. There's something very beyond sea about it. Uh, because she's seeing something that she cannot explain. And then when they find the victim, she's just so shook to the core because she doesn't want to admit it. And it leads to an amazing conversation later with Mulder uh, when, you know, she's saying, do you want me to say I believe it even if I don't? Even though she saw it, she still doesn't believe. And again, we, we said it, she said it in Beyond the Sea. She's afraid to believe. Um, and, you know, she can't explain it. She, she wants, she has to be able to explain it. Mulder just believes without anything. But... The thing that is great about their partnership is obviously Scully teaches him, you know, by, you know, he learns to start respecting the evidence to prove stuff. Uh, and she needs more than just she saw it. She's like, I imagined it or it was just an emotional moment or something. She's trying to work it out in her head. And she goes to the hospital um, to get checked out and stuff like that. And And then we see her. In Karen Kosev's, uh, you know, the counsellor, uh, who, again, we've not seen for quite a while. Uh, she goes see Karen Kosev uh, at the Bureau to have a therapy session. And, you know, she talks. It's just beautiful, the acting here. And the script is just amazing. Uh, I think this is some of John Scheiben's best writing uh, and yeah, it, it's I think, excellent direction by, uh, I think, James Charleston, who is a, 
an occasional director who I know I don't really mention on these videos, but he does some really good work. Um, but yeah, she's just talking about how, um, you know, she doesn't feel like this stuff, especially like, you know, about this ghost, she saw something. She doesn't feel like she could talk to Mulder about it. And, and Karen's like, you, you know, you have a fear of failing him. And you could see Scully really processing it. And there's so much amazing dialogue in this one session. It's so weird because the, the murders are in the background. It turns out that the nurse at this mental institution is uh, abusing the patients. Uh, she's taken Harold's medication away. Well, she, she says she's poisoning him, so he stops taking his medication. Uh, and I think she's the one doing the murders. I, I don't know. I'm a bit confused by that at the end. Uh, I'm pretty sure she was the one doing the murders. She, she, she attacks Scully at the end um, in the bathroom. Another bathroom encounter for poor Scully. Uh, but yeah, no, there's all that stuff going on. And all the story, the investigation, the she is me uh, words that are popping up. Uh, again, I'm not clear on how, like, did, did Harold scrape those words into the uh, bowling lane? Or did they just appear or, or what? uh there's some there are some loose ends everybody's gonna be jumping up going oh my god it was so obvious at the end but for me there was some stuff where i was just looking for answers that weren't there all that stuff is going on the investigation uh you know scully's there for the most part but she goes off to the hospital and stuff uh to check get that checked out after she's uh, been shaken up and stuff like that uh and but that's the thing you've got the investigation going on but the real main center of this episode easily for me is just the emotional ties with more more depth to the Mulder scully dynamic what's going on with the cancer and uh you know how it's affecting scully this is easily the most uh, these episodes with that thread going on in the background just show what this show could have done if it had focused more on some kind of serialization. Uh, this felt like more of a uh, an experiment because then season five was a lot of myth arc lead up for the Fight the Future movie. Uh, I kind of feel like this was testing the waters a little bit. Uh, but I, I think this is a really enjoyable episode. Has a few is issues. Um, but there's some excellent acting here. Uh, the guy, I don't remember, the actor who plays Harold, uh, I think he does a good job. Uh, I don't know how much research he did. It, do it doesn't feel too cartoonish and, and uncomfortable. Um yeah i just I, this is just an emotional roller coaster and uh, for scully you know we don't we and just watching Mulder watch her with concern and again their talk at the end where you know they argue and Mulder's like do you think i just want to say you believe and you could see it click in her head that that's not what she thinks she knows that that's not what he wants he wants her to believe what she believes, but at least admit it. Be truthful. Don't lie. You know, just respect the, the, the you know, the, the work and stuff like that. And I, I will say my biggest issue with this episode is there's a scene where Mulder goes around to Scully's um, to, to get some medical uh, information when he thinks that maybe Harold is dying. Uh, and he's going on, oh, who's more likely to see ghosts uh, than somebody who's dying? Bear in mind, he stood in front of a woman who has cancer. Now, I know, I know. He then, like, realises he's messed up and is like, oh, you know, uh, how did he go at the hospital and stuff? And he's finding out. I get the idea that he's so invested in the investigation that there's a moment where he just forgets it for a moment. 
but yeah it felt a little insensitive and yeah just that scene of scully crying at the end in the car when she sees harold's ghost just her mortality catching up with her it's it's just heartbreaking um this is an episode i actually skip a lot it's not that i don't like it at all um i just i don't think much of it and i think because of the issues it puts me off the idea of re-watching it um i think this is a perfect binge watching session episode because it is so in line with the other you know the cancer arc stories uh you know stories that you know uh, are so f are focused have a end goal where they're heading uh in a way that i don't think we got again until say Mulder's abduction arc in season eight uh it is not a perfect episode by any means but it is highly entertaining uh and when i managed to grab it um i am gonna put it in a i'm gonna put it in a it is really good but it is flawed uh but there's some fun acting in here and just the emotional kick is just ugh. and it's that scene with karen kosev is just oh it makes me cry and i i think just scully's you know it wasn't until now I realised how much I rely on Mulder and his passion and stuff like that. And we kind of got that in season three in uh, the Piper Maru. Uh, again, it's not, it's, it's Nisai, isn't it? Um, anyway, when she does that whole, uh, you know, I'm just constantly amazed by you and stuff like that. And I think there's little moments like that where she really starts to appreciate the partnership. Uh, and especially this one so um next up we've got the penultimate episode of the season demons uh we've had a very scully like emotional journey episode and now we've got Mulder's journey as we continue to try and figure out in his brain what happened to his sister why it happened to his sister uh by him waking up uh, again there's something very uh, Tempest Fugia about this the way the story is laid out uh, the way it's told you know it's Mulder waking up in a hotel uh, there's blood all over his shirt but it's not his own blood and then you've got the investigation trying to figure out how he got to this point his memory he's lost his memory he's got a uh, amnesia of what happened over the last like 48 hours or whatever it is the last thing he remembers is talking to Scully on the phone on Friday night uh which again gives us a bit of insight into their partnership and you know stuff um yeah this 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 is a really good episode it's a little i don't know it's a little flimsy with its story he relies on Mulder is apparently just uh talking to these abductees but then they die in a murder suicide uh and Mulder's there because it turns out he was talking to them. Uh, and it's because they all, these, uh, the Cassandras and uh, this police cop who conveniently works at the district, uh, at the precinct where Mulder is arrested by Jay Akavone's uh, detective uh, on suspicion of killing these people. Um, conveniently, this police officer works at that precinct and kills himself while scully's still there and uh yeah and it turns out that they've all had this uh this procedure we'll use it in, in procedure um to drill holes in their brain while being doped up on like ketamine um to get memories back uh doesn't matter whether they're real or not they're just things that they see uh, while having like a VR headset flash lights at their eyes um, and of course Mulder is trying to figure out the the mystery of what he saw you know he keeps getting these flashes during the episode of uh, seeing Samantha and they're watching over his his parents argue and smoking man is there and they're arguing about getting uh, that Samantha will be taken uh, and yeah it's it's really hot pound watching scully be like no molder 
I'm going to sort this out. You go to the hospital. And Mulder's like, no, 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 no. Uh, I think the biggest thing I took away from this episode was we learned that Scully, there's a good reason why Scully isn't allowed to drive. Oh, my God. They go to this doctor's uh, uh, practice. <laughs> Scully pulls up her parking. <laughs> I know there's an ongoing joke about Jillian not be the great being the greatest driver. But my God, Scully's parking is just awful. She takes up two parking spaces. She's one of those people. <laughs> it's, it's, you know what, that's, you know what, the thing to take away, if anything stands out about this episode, that is the one thing that just, I always think of this as the episode where Scully badly parks. She's like at this angle, just completely taking up these two spots. Um, but yeah, and <laughs> you see her worrying about him. You see him trying to piece the, uh, the, the, the pieces together to try and find out what happened to these poor people. They kind of get forgotten really quickly. Like, Jay Akavone's detective, who I don't remember the name of, he has no time for federal agents. He's just like, no, you're, you're guilty, so I'm locking you up. And Scully's like there, just like, you're you've got the wrong man. <laughs> she thought like she's gonna whip her gun out and shoot this guy if he doesn't let Mulder out of prison. Um, and then you have this scene where they're trying to get it, and they go to Mrs. Mulder's. Again, it's nice to see her turn up. Bless her, she's still just like, what the hell? Um, she's just like, Fox, what what's wrong? And he's like, you 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 you. You made a choice. You you chose Samantha, uh, and can we and this and ever. And she turns to Scully. It's so funny because we never. I don't think we. I think this is literally the only time we really get Scully and uh, Mrs. Mulder in the same room together. Uh, Tina Mulder turns to Scully and is just like, "What's wrong with him?" And Scully's just like, "He's um, yeah, there's stuff going on." Mulder's like, you slept with uh, Smoking Man, didn't you? And she slaps him. I mean, the fact that we find out... I, I love that the seed is placed here for who is my father. Uh, considering we find out that Smoking Man is Mulder's father in like three seasons. Um, it's funny to see that placed here. It is more annoying to see... Uh, Tina acts so absolutely disgusted by the notion, even though we totally know she was knocking boots with uh, old Smokey. Um, she 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 makes it quite. Good. She's just like, "Don't how dare you! I never cheated on your father." It's like, "Wow, liar, liar, pants on fire." Uh, it's just nice to see more emotion from uh, from Rebecca Tulin, uh, who plays uh, Mrs. Mulder. Uh, than we've really had much chance to ever experience. I was thinking this is probably actually the most screen time she gets ever. Um, so, yeah, it's those. there's a lot of good scenes here. Uh, a lot of good drama because you're trying to figure out the pieces with Mulder. Um, I just enjoy this one. I love the, the bit of the time when uh, the Doctor is arrested. Uh, after Mulder has gone to him to get another uh, hole in the head for more memories. Uh, and Scully chases down the cop car, open that door and, and grabs a, uh, grabs the doctor. He's like, where is he? He's, he, you're the one he would have come to. She's just trying to find out where Mulder is and, uh, you know, ends back up at Quanakatog. Uh There's just a lot of beautiful scenes here. Uh, again, ex more excellent partnership uh, scenes, a concern, a lot of touching of Scully while she's trying to uh, check on Mulder and, you know, when he's having these uh, seizures and stuff like that. A lot of worry, uh, a lot of Mulder torture and Scully comfort. Um, it's really entertaining. Uh, I do feel like the victims get forgotten quite quickly. Uh, it's just like, oh, well, we figured out that Mulder didn't kill them. Uh, let's figure out what's going on with Mulder now. <laughs> so, it's, oh, oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, it can be a little clunky. Uh, but this is a really good episode uh, brought to us by uh, uh, Bob Goodwin. 
uh, normal uh, who normally directs episodes, and I think he directed the next episode as well. Um, but yeah, a, a story from him, uh, directed by Kim Manners, uh, excellent direction. Um, the flashing seizures can get a little repetitive, just Samantha constantly going, Fox, Fox, Fox. I'm just like, okay, and, and just keep seeing the flashes and that. That And definitely don't watch this if you've got epilepsy, because this is a flashing images uh, nightmare. Um, but the fl at the same time, the flashes do, you know, they give reason for Scully to worry about Mulder. <laughs> I... I it's frustrating because it's the same thing over and over again and you're getting no real progression except maybe then a flash of smoking man stood in the doorway or whatever it's just it's just a scene of mr and mrs Mulder const uh, just fighting over the choice of giving up samantha so that can get a little repetitive um yeah and 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 you do have to wonder who if if this doctor is working for the syndicate or that uh you don't get any answers to that he gets arrested and he's taken away and he's never spoken of again um but i really enjoyed this episode genuinely uh i think it's just another powerhouse in acting um and just the presentation of the partnership uh it doesn't add much it's forgotten really quickly uh but the end scene is beautiful uh, where Mulder, uh, Scully talks Mulder out of shooting uh, her or himself. Uh, it's It has its moments of issues, but I'm going to put it in A. It's not perfect by any means, which is why I'm not putting it in S. Uh, but it is definitely enjoyable uh, and entertaining and uh, just good drama. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to put it in A. Um, but... If you want drama let's get to the season finale that is gethsemane um which uh really kind of it starts out with this teaser where scully identifies the body you recognize the the apartment as Mulder's apartment and they're like is it him and she, and can we give props to scully because we find you know spoilers um for a 30 year old show but um yeah Mulder's not really dead uh and uh he, he hasn't killed himself so this and scully's lying for him the fact that she does such a good job can we give scully an academy an emmy or something because she did a really good job of just like yeah it's him and she looks genuinely <laughs> broken she pulled that off brilliantly uh and you know for the most part the the panel that she then goes to to seemingly it, see at this at this teaser she's there at this panel with like chief blevins and that uh which is somebody we've not seen for ages uh she 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 completely goes i'm here to to uh you know the the lack of valid uh, credibility of Mulder's work I'm here to completely you know it was go it was a lie and you're like wow Scully super bitch you're like what the hell is going on here um but again unfortunately this is another episode and yeah this is another episode that likes to go for that in media res uh, thing um where we then go 24 hours earlier or whatever it is and it turns out that Mulder's gone, uh, he's been contacted by this uh, professor where this uh, up in the, uh, IC, the, the U Yukon territory or something, uh, this alien has been found in ice. Uh, it turns out it's fake anyway, but the professor believes it's real. So he calls in Mulder. So Mulder goes and he's like, oh, you know, Scully, are you going to come? And she's like, I'm not it I'm just no it's not even worth it what's the point and it is interesting that Mulder doesn't check to see again I get it he's single-minded his focus is on that um but we then find out from the voiceover from this hearing that what she hadn't what and again 
it bothers me that Scully didn't tell Mulder. I get that she's terrified and, and all that stuff, but um, she hasn't told Mulder that the cancer has metastasized, uh, gone into her bloodstream. So, you know, the chance of survival now is literally zero. Uh, so she's like, you know, she hasn't told him that and, you know, her last days on Earth, she doesn't want to be chasing this alien and stuff. And Mulder's like, oh, you know, if you could have the proof of God, would you, wouldn't you? would you go for it? And she'd be like, only if it could be disproven. And you're just like, I get it. I get it. The it, faith, belief, you know, what you can prove and what you can't prove. Uh, but yeah, it feels really strained um, considering a lot of the partnership build-up we've had in these previous episodes. Um, but yeah, we, we see this lovely scene, this awkward scene, sorry, of Scully's family, who are apparently super rich. <laughs> I know they're a big, you know, Navy family uh, and all that stuff, but I'm sorry, I'm super distracted by the waitress uh, that that takes people's coats as they enter the house and everything. I was just like, why did they have to have her dressed up as like a French waitress as well? It was, I was just like, okay, like a house, house, you know, housemaid kind of thing. Um, I was like, well, I, okay. I, I didn't know, but I guess, I guess it should have made sense seeing as my, 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 my Scully is, uh, Maggie Scully is in this massive house. Um, but yeah, they're trying to get Scully in contact with their priest, Father McHugh, and there's this awkward moment at the dinner table where uh, he's like, oh, you know, your mother called, and she's like, look, I just, I, I'm trying to find my own way to deal with this and stuff like that. Uh, there's some, but then we have the whole thing where Michael Krishkow comes into the frame. Oh, Michael Criscow. Actually, you know what? He doesn't turn up until really late in this episode. Mulder's off investigating uh, this alien, watching the doctor, d the professor do this uh, uh, autopsy and everything, uh, even though it turns out that the cameraman is uh, uh, working for the opposition. Uh, and Scully's uh, got this ice core that she's uh, d getting tests done on and everything to see if it's uh, legit. Um, and Michael Krishkow turns up to steal this ice core um, and knock Scully down the stairs. Uh, and we get this, this, oh, this, mm, oh, Pat Skipper. I, you know, Pat Skipper as uh, Bill Scully Jr. Oh, just somebody, talk about punching Krychek earlier in the season. Bill Scully Jr. is just, the person you want to beat the little sh he has a smug grin and you just want to punch him like but not in a fun way and that sounds really weird to say but i just want to punch him and i get it i know why it his main purpose is to make you to be that caring family member who is essentially a threat to our protagonist uh you know the the relationship between Mulder and Scully because he hates Mulder's guts and he's like you know I've not told I've not told mum and, and and all that stuff who who is your responsibility to this guy Mulder well where is he and 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 yeah there's that moment where you see the the consideration on Scully's uh, mind where you know Mulder's off chasing aliens and but at the same time you're like during Memento Mori that's what she wanted him doing she wanted him out there finding answers to to life the universe and and all that stuff um but yeah I I get it but but then we go back to Krish Cow who who then Scully like a boss manages to catch uh after some investigation um, and he's like, oh, it's all a lie. And it's not too bad here. John Finn does a good job with the, the script that he's given. Um, but yeah, this this is a very Chris Carter script. Uh, you can definitely feel it at times. And I don't know if that's just because of the treatment of Scully or, or what. But um, yeah, this, this episode, it is tense. The To Be Continued... I remember 
I, to this day, remember the Redux Trilogy uh, VHS, like it being on display in like Sainsbury's, you know, or whatever it was. And the big selling point was, is Mulder dead? Mulder killed himself, you know, this, that, and the other. And I just remember at the time being like, wait, what? What is this about? And I, I remember having uh, buying the, the VHS and watching that. And it was nowhere near it. Like that first, fin completing Gethsemane. Because obviously on those VHSs, they were one episode after the other without the credits. Um, but yeah, I, I'm so glad I saw that before seeing it on BBC. Because if I'd had to watch that with then like a year gap for that de to be continued, I just would have been like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> um, yeah, this... You know what, though? I am wondering now if I saw this episode before the VHS... I don't remember. God, I'm old. I'm so old. This was so long ago. I might have. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, no, it. That the idea of that to be continued. Oh, just awful. Uh, this episode, unfortunately, does suffer a lot of pitfalls uh, due to its writing. It is nowhere near as some of the writing in the Redux uh, Redux Two duo. Um, as a season ender, though, uh, it is a good ending. Um, it has got a lot of uh, tense, uh, dramatic moments. Uh, we've now got, you know, the, the, the ball rolling on the severity of Scully's cancer, which we've been leading up to for 10 episodes uh, or so. Um, yeah, this is a good episode, but it is not great. Uh, it's got some good action. Um, the scenes up in the, the the stuff up in the the Yukon, you know, up in the icy uh, area is a bit. Eh. Um, it's a good episode, but I feel it plods at times. Um, I certainly don't think it's any better than uh, Heron Volk. Um, so as a result, I'm going to put it in B. There's, there's just something about it that's not great. And I don't know, it's, I don't know, maybe it's its themes of belief and God and, and all that stuff uh, that I feel it gets a bit too, much like, say, the Six Extinction trilogy, I think it gets a little embroiled. There's a lot of good setup here for what will continue in Redux. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's not the, the best uh, season finale. And uh, it's certainly not the best, uh, you know, the, the myth arc episode blocks. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it's enjoyable and it's good setup and good drama but not the greatest, unfortunately. Um, but I would like to point out that I know it looks like I've not been fair to this season, and to say that would be fair in itself. Uh, I have been a little brutal at times, but um, S and A are, for me, like, the top. I know, I, I just think the ones in A there is something about them that doesn't make them perfect uh but otherwise they're brilliant and enjoyable um i do feel like i've been a little harsh on heron volk i kind of want to put it up to a but i'm gonna stick to my guns uh b is by no means bad it is still entertaining it just it sometimes i have to be in the right mood for it and I think, especially on this binge watch, some of these just did not click for me. Uh, Heron Vogue, like I say, is normally one I enjoy excessively. Um, but it just, I think, just a lot of hindsight. And even C, if I hated these episodes, I would put them in D without question. Um, but I don't hate them. I just, eh, they're just a bit, yeah. And again, I think, they're the kind of things that you have to turn your brain off really to 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 get much i mean synchrony has its moments 
Um, to be honest, Synchrony I probably enjoy way more than I do Unrequited. Um, but yeah, no, I know it feels like I've been unfair. Uh, I've certainly been brutal. I won't lie. I will put my hands up and say I've been brutal. Um, but yeah, I just, again, I'm doing this from my binge watching experience. Uh, and these episodes in a row, it's a much different viewing experience. Uh, but yeah, that's season four. Finally got this video done. It's nice to, it was nice actually this half to uh, record something that I hadn't recorded about 400 times before. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for watching guys I completely understand if if you have issues with my lists this has been a tough one this is actually genuinely I've been torn before on stuff but this was this was genuinely tough to 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 rank some of these and and to put them either lower down or, or whatever uh, but yeah please share your thoughts please share your thoughts on your please share your favorite episodes uh i'd be re i really look forward to hearing your thoughts i you know i make these as i said before i make these as a hobby um i make these uh to to enjoy the the interaction kind of thing so yeah please share your thoughts and uh i'm gonna let's say um it's uh start of uh middle of the week so i'm gonna uh, start watching season five hopefully this weekend uh so hopefully fingers crossed uh we might have season five tiered at least if not the end of the year um then hopefully the start of next year uh but please take care Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your support. Link is in the description for the playlist for other Exiles related uh, videos. My reactions to episodes and merchandise, etc, uh, etc. Et uh, link is in the description for the tier uh, template that I've used here on tiermaker.com. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, check out the first half if you haven't already. Uh, and I guess this has kind of spoiled it, uh, where everything is. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, please uh, check out my other stuff. Please like, subscribe, take care, and I will see you somewhere down the line.